Now, though, it's time to meet Rail Pasta, M0RTP. If you have any questions to ask Rail, do write them on the YouTube chat facility, as long as they don't get uh, buried in the chat. And as long as we have time towards the end, we'll do our best to include them. And please make sure you have your call sign on there. That'd be very nice. Now, I seem to remember a time when there were letters to and arguments in Radcom and Practical Wireless decrying magnetic loop antennas as amateur radio snake oil. That's, that's how I remember it anyway. But there's no doubt, Rail, they're now an effective solution to getting us on air where space is limited for, for one thing. So there's one thing radio amateurs can agree upon is if you can't hear a remote station, you can't work the remote station. So, you know, to quote Scott Adams, engineers like to solve problems. And if there are no problems handily available, they will create their own problems to solve. So I'm Rail Pastor, M0RTP, and I'm going to give you an overview of what I've done to overcome some of the challenges at my QTH in order to work the world and go into, you know, a little bit about who I am, the why, the what, the how you too can get some of these results from your backyard or attic. So this presentation will be available to you to download. So if I'm going to be moving through the slides at some pace and I'm using them just really as an aid to what I'm presenting. So by all means, also reach out to me after the event to find out anything more about loops and how you can get on the air with them. So without much further ado, I've been in amateur radio for probably close, fast approaching 40 years. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm, an ex I'm a tinker try experimenter and uh, I have my share of RF burns to prove it. Don't recommend them. I'm a member of RADOC. I have interests in Arduino, ESP32, home automation, amateur radio, of course, building antenna systems, building linear amplifiers. I built a number of station controllers using microcontrollers, et cetera, and uh, small computing devices. I work in the IT industry. So what is the talk going to cover? The talk's going to cover some of the controversy, the snake oil that has been mentioned. And I'm actually going to include some thermal imaging scans that I've done of magnetic loops, just to demonstrate that they aren't glorified garden warmers. I will also share my experiences of the, the how, the what you need to do in order to get an efficiently designed loop. I won't go unnecessarily into the theory. Uh, you know, if you want the theory there, I can point you at plenty of sites towards the end of the presentation where you can get into the theory. There are some additional considerations, especially if you're building QRO loops and some operating practices you need to have in mind. I will cover the performance of the loops using Whisper and FT8 in particular and demonstrating some proof through the QSLs that I've had. I will also cover what I've done to achieve 10 through 160 meter coverage uh, through a station controller controlling three loops. Automagically having a broadband antenna system, if you will, using magnetic loops that are renowned for being high Q. I do wanna add one disclaimer, and that is any commercial products are a subset available on the market. They do not carry any endorsement from myself and I don't get any commercial gain and your mileage will certainly vary. One last point. If I have got any references missing from source material on here, please let me know. I can hardly claim an original thought for very much of this. So why loops? Well, when I moved to the UK, I had a new QTH. I ideally wanted to operate on all HF bands. I had insufficient space as many of you do an insufficient height to build an antenna system that would support an 80 and 160 meter uncompromised antenna system. Below 10 megahertz, RF hostile environment. My next door neighbors had inverters, solar panels, plasma TVs, power line devices. Within, within the near field of one wavelength, I had countless ADSL devices and wall warts and you name it. S9 plus 20 at times. Loops tend to be less sensitive to electrical noise in the, in the near field. They have very sharp nulls, which allows you to turn and counteract the most offensive sources. And they're small enough to rotate with a TV rotator. The biggest issue that I was facing was um, my XYL 
didn't fancy a very large antenna system in the garden. Just getting away with some loots was, uh, was quite a win. And my next door neighbors and the neighborhood attention after having had some wire antennas up did draw the attention of uh, the local council. So I did need something that was inconspicuous and would draw less neighborhood attention. I also was looking for something that could be close to the ground without having to go into planning permissions and having to speak to the bank manager. The other thing I was looking to do is operate in a multi-TX environment and having high Q would be good. So the million dollar question is, and the snake oil element that was alluded to is, are they garden warmers? Well, the first image that you see up here, excuse the spurs, those are actually cable ties, is a magnetic loop that's been operating for several hours, FD8, and the thermal scan shows a temperature range of between zero and 12 degrees on a day that is uh, seven or eight degrees outside. A dummy load operating for about 15 minutes, similar load, reaching 26 degrees. Now this is by no means conclusive evidence, but if you've been operating for several hours, putting in 400 watts into a loop, and it was all resistive loss, you'd have a garden warmer. So therefore, in my opinion, Transmitting magnetic loop antennas are not garden warmers. And furthermore, if we look into some of the results achieved, we can then see that with uh, having achieved DXCC on six bands, 209 uh, countries worked according to Logbook of the World, uh, 213 on QRZ, um, you know, 1138 band slots, 800 plus counties in the US work, 39 or 40 Q or Q or CQ zones worked. I'm fairly confident to say that loops do work. In terms of the map of the world of where I've operated and, uh, sorry, of where I've reached and QSL, uh, my only blind spot has really been Africa, mainly because of, I guess, stations operating then and perhaps the orientation and my pursuit of them and the, the time window that I've been operating. So when it comes to antennas, you really get to pick two of the following. You can have small size, efficiency, or bandwidth. Since transmitting magnetic loop antennas are small, they tend to be efficient. Therefore, the bandwidth, the, the Q will be high. And when designed appropriately, this is the key point, when designed appropriately, they are very efficient and effective for their size. So if we look at some of the basic loop characteristics, what you've got is an oversized inductor and a variable capacitor giving us a resonant circuit. We've got to overcome the resistive loss in the circuit. And then we've got our radiation resistance. Now, we then have a couple of coupling methods that we can look at, which we'll go into a bit later. We've got coupling loops, gamma matches, twisted gamma matches, ferrite cores, transformative couplings, and so on. And they each have their relative benefits. What we're going to do is we're also going to look at what are the components you require and how you size and scale them. Now, a variable capacitor is used to tune the loop for resonance, as you would have any capacitor in a resonance circuit. The thing I do want to point out to you is that the circulating voltage, sorry, the voltage across the cap capacitor and the circulating current, they're extremely high. You know, even at QRP levels, you can get a thousand volts across the capacitor. And if you're operating at hundred watts, you can get 10 kV across your vacuum capacitor or variable capacitor. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is where the design of the loop comes in to play and the components that we're using. The other thing I just want to point out is that you really do want to have some sort of remote tune capability for a loop, because if you're trying to tune for SWR and you're adjusting the capacitor manually and you key down, it's going to hurt. I don't recommend that. So op safe operating procedures do not touch the loop when you are tuning it, especially if you're operating 10, 20, 100, 400, for those of you in America, kilowatt plus. 
So as you've mentioned, it would be remiss of me not to put a disclaimer in here and a warning. <clears throat> RF burns are serious. They can be deadly. You know, it's the volts that jolts, but it's the mills that kills. So be careful, be vigilant. So why vacuum variable capacitors? Well, as I've alluded to, massive voltages across the capacitor. And if you're looking at a high voltage air butterfly capacitor, they typically are 3.7 to 5 kV uh, rated. Well, if you look at the Jennings vacuum variable capacitors, the ones that I've been working with are typically max 15 kV, where the Soviet era new old stock vacuum variable capacitors, such as the KP14, they have a 10 kV nominal rating, but you can push it to 20 kV in bursts and 50 amp uh, nominal rating. We'll get into um, some recommendations. So in terms of recommendations for vacuum variable capacitors, because they really are the heart of your magnetic loop, the transmitting magnetic loop antenna, I do recommend the KP14 vacuum variable capacitors made in the late 80s. They're typically sold as new old stock on the ubiquitous online flea bay auction sites and the like. 7.5 to 350 puff is the magic capacitance for those of you starting out on this adventure. For those of you who are building specific antenna systems and you're gonna have multiple loops, then I would perhaps look to the 5 to 100 puff KP14 capacitors, which are a little bit more manageable, whoops, a little bit more manageable in size and a, and a little bit cheaper on uh, the online uh, auction sites. In terms of relative sizings, I've put a one liter Pepsi bottle alongside the KP13 on the left hand side, which is roughly the size of a rugby ball. The KP14, which I had up first, the one that I do recommend for most of you getting started, which is a little bit smaller than a one liter bottle. It's easy enough to manage. It's easy enough to mechanically couple to a loop. And then those of you who want to build portable loops or portable QRO loops or uh, just ease of mounting the uh, KP14 25KV. So, Moving on to sizing a loop, and we're going to get into some of the formulas and construction later. My recommendations broadly as a sort of a rule of thumb, ideally size between one eighth and one quarter of a wavelength. Bearing in mind, the closer you get to a quarter of a wavelength, you're going to start exhibiting electrical properties in the loop of an electrical antenna. Now for optimal bandwidth, this is this is the magic band. A lot of people operate or build loops around a tenth of the size of a wavelength. The problem we'll see a little bit later is the voltages and the currents will be quite high when operating QRO. So the magic numbers are a quarter to a, an eighth of a wavelength. This is, allows you to have a lower capacitance required for the variable capacitor and a lower operating current. The other important considerations, and this is really important, is how are you going to have structural integrity for the loop, given weather, if it's sitting outside, and is it going to be self-supporting, and so on. So I found 28 millimeter copper to be pretty robust, self-supporting. It's of the appropriate size and dimension to give us the performance that you've seen before. And the other factor is you want a price performance ratio that you want to balance. The other option, is heliax or equivalent, which is 7 eighths of an inch, near, near enough to 28 millimeter, uh, where you can snugly fit toroids, toroids if you're doing a toroidal coupling, which we'll get into shortly, easily over 28 mil copper or over the heliax. And the reason I will recommend shortly the toroidal couplings is that if you're experimenting, changing the number of windings that you have on your coupling is much easier than having to cut solder when you're doing a, uh, a coupling loop. So, moving on. When building the actual loop itself, you ideally want to go for a circular loop. 
if you can't get a circulator if you're using uh, copper piping and you don't have access to a ring roller, I would then suggest making an octagonal loop or a square loop. They will work just as well. But for maximum efficiency, a circular loop. You want to maximize the area inside the loop. The loops generally are vertically oriented when you're operating within a wavelength of the ground. If you're going to be operating above a wavelength of the ground, then you can have them horizontally uh, oriented. But all the loops for the consideration today will be vertically or with vertically mounted in mind. The most important thing that I can absolutely recommend is you need to solder, braze, weld your joints. Mechanically connected joints, you know, they are going to introduce resistive losses. The other important consideration is definitely buy the highest nominal voltage and current rating for the variable capacitor that your budget can afford. Because when the bug bites you, you're going to want to uh, push it. Now, in terms of loop coupling options, I've already alluded to and touched on the transformative coupling. This is extremely effective. I've got them in a number of my loops and loops that are built for folks because they're easy to get going. They're easy to just match. And if you are thinking of starting on this journey, definitely start here. The next option is a coupling loop. Sizing the coupling loop is a consideration and the distance of the coupling loop from the main loop is the next consideration. And we'll get into some of those considerations in a later slide. The other two cup, uh, coupling methods that are quite popular are the asymmetric gamma match and the twisted gamma match. These are very effective as well. A little bit more fiddly for those of you who are getting started. So I would definitely start my way on the left hand side and move all the way to the right. Now in terms of the uh, toroids, the FT240 is easily available. Um, highly recommended. The Type 43 mix is very good for 160, through, 160 meters through 20 meters. And for those of you operating on 30 through 10 meters or a loop for 30 through 10, use type 61 mixes. The difference being here is the number of windings you're going to require on that transformative coupling. In terms of a coupling loop, there's two, there is a little bit of a debate, if you will, on how the size you should use on the internet as well as amongst amateurs. From my personal operating experiences and building experiences, when building a loop for 12 through 20 meters, I typically use one fifth of the main loop circumference as the size of the coupling loop. When operating 30, 40 meters, it's a quarter. On 60, 80, a third of the main loop circumference. Now there are a number of factors that come into play. Are you doing a multi-turn loop? Or is it a single turn loop? But broadly speaking, um, when starting out here, the, this is a good starting point. Always size your coupling loop a little bit larger and cut it back. The next thing in terms of uh, matching the coupling loop to the main loop is you vary the distance of the coupling loop from the main loop by up to about 10 centimeters, let's call it four inches. Please do make sure your coupling loop is insulated from the main loop. <clears throat> so, in terms of mounting the capacitor to your loop, in the background, this is an octagonal loop built out of 28 millimeter copper. What I've done is taken the copper and I've hammered it flat. And by hammering that, that, that copper flat, I've then drilled it, put the uh, bracelet onto the flattened copper, and mounted the capacitor. To the side, you will see, if I can get the cursor over here, you should see a cursor moving around. Uh, this is a kitchen cutting board that I've cut just to insulate the stepper motor from the vacuum variable capacitor. Now it is extremely important to insulate your stepper motor from the capacitor. And the reason for that is that the uh, vacuum variable capacitor, the tip of the vacuum variable capacitor, the shaft, that is RF hot. If you touch that when transmitting, expect to burn, especially if you are 
depending on the voltage levels, more than a burn. <clears throat> do not touch that. In fact, do not touch the loop when it's been keying down. So therefore, make sure when you've got a stepper motor, your coupling to the stepper motor has a, some sort of perspex or some non-insulating shaft to the uh, coupling, right? Get that in there. Make sure it is isolated. Very, very important. Otherwise, you're going to find the magic smoke coming out of your equipment inside your shack. So moving on. <clears throat> the other options for coupling I've found, if you can't get hold of the uh, the bracelets that were purposefully designed for these KP13s and KP14s, because they definitely are in short supply, using heavy-duty hose clamps, such as these, which you can get for a couple of pounds, again, ubiquitous websites or Google uh, heavy-duty vacuum, uh, sorry, heavy-duty hose clamp. They are made from zinc or stainless steel. Not the best for uh, conductivity compared to copper. So that is why I use copper braid that I insert underneath the uh, clamp. The other option is to go with the uh, Jubilee hose clips. Just to go around the, let me just get this, vacuum capacitor. Clamp goes over it. Insert the um, copper braid. All right. Moving on to a couple of designs. What I've done here is taken a loop, a 160 meter loop uh, for the 160 meter band, 20 meters of Heliax around a, effectively it's a 2.12 meter former made out of 50 millimeter uh, PVC plumbing pipe. Inside the 50 millimeter PVC plumbing pipe, you will see over here, I've inserted 32 by 32 millimeter timber in order to give it some structural integrity. That former, uh, pretty robust, you know, given that it's two meters, it's about this, call it a little bit larger or taller than uh, most people, but easy enough to lift, manage, turn around, rotate again. <clears throat> I then have, you know, if you look at a seven meter loop over here, as an example, inside, you can see the, the 32 millimeter timber inside the PVC, above it, the vacuum capacitor with the kitchen cutting board that is being used as a former to separate the uh, stepper motors. The thing that's not in the picture is a DVD storage box. You can go buy DVD storage boxes. They work as a very nice shroud to put over and then to create a weatherproofing for your vacuum capacitor and stepper motor. Now, here is a great tip for you. When using something like LDF 550 and you drill out the core, you can take 22 millimeter copper and insert it. When you insert the 22 millimeter copper inside the Heliax and you hammer the uh, pipe flat, you get something that looks like this. Using a pipe bender, bending a, a turn, drilling it, you've now got a nice mounting point for your vacuum capacitor onto the main inductor, the loop. Moving on in the interest, interest of time, it's really important that you use common mode choking. I don't like inline common, load, common mode chokes because everything you insert in the line is going to introduce some form of loss. So getting uh, the snap-on or clip-on uh, ch uh, chokes makes makes perfect sense. You want as much imp uh, imp impedance as you can get. I have them at the antenna end as well as I have them at the shack end. Minimum of 5,000 ohms of impedance. I would recommend the same thing for the stepper motor control cable because you are going to be picking up RF onto your stepper motor control. Now for some theory. In the interest of time, I'm going to spare you the theory other than to say the theory is there. There are some very good online uh, loop calculators. 
The one is an Excel based calculator by AA5TB. The other is the 66 specific online calculator, which I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples just to give you the uh, sizing and the number of you know, the kind of voltage and current you're going to see in a loop. So by way of an example, if you were to nav navigate to the Pacific Loop calculator, which uh, is on the, oops, where is it? I don't see it. Oh, there we go. The link is there. Um, you plug in parameters like what is the size of the conductor that you're using, the circumference of your loop, the diameter of the material you're using, the frequency you wish to operate on, and the transmitting power. It's optional, but it'll give you an idea. If you put the power in there, it'll tell you what the voltages and current will be. So as an example, if we look at a loop for 20 meters with a five meter circumference, the efficiency of that loop, apologies, it's quite small, will be 92% efficient. It'll be 4 dB below an isotropic antenna. It'll have a bandwidth of 48.9 kilohertz and require a tuning capacitance of 28 puff. The voltage across the capacitor will be 3,300 volts with a circulating current of 8.57 amps. This, by all means, is a well-designed loop for 20 meters. If we put 400 watts through there, the circulating voltage, sorry, the voltage across the capacitor will be 6,700 volts RMS with a circulating current of 17 amps. If we were to change this, to a four meter circumference loop operating on 40 meters, the efficiency drops to 31%, so five dB below an isotropic antenna. You'd require 154 puff. You'd have 4.5 kilohertz of bandwidth. The voltage across the cap will be 4,700 volts the circulating current 33 amps. We move this up to 400 watts into the loop. Suddenly you need 9,500 volts and the circulating current will be 66 amps. This is outside of the operating parameters of these capacitors and you're likely to do damage to your amplifier. So moving to a five meter circumference loop. All, we, all we're doing is moving from four meter circumference loop to a five meter circumference. The voltage across the capacitor is 9,900, well within op nominal operating parameters. The resonating circulating current is 50 amps. Again, well within operating parameters. So the size of the loop does matter. It does matter if you want to operate a QRO. And again, you'll notice the magic number 40 meters, five meters, 40 meter band, five meter circumference is one eighth. So one eighth is the absolute minimum you want to go to. If you go in your, in your own time, go have size up a 10 meter loop, you'll, you'll find that the, the values come down dramatically. So how does one test the performance of the loop immediately after you've constructed it? Well, the easiest ways that I've found to do that is just to use FT8 and digital modes and then using PSK Reporter to give me a feedback on who's received my signal and plotted it on PSK Reporter using Whisper, using CW Reverse Beacon Network, using Web SDRs, all ways for you to determine whether your loop is functioning to your satisfaction. Spending a moment on Whisper, <clears throat> I found Whisper to be very, very effective, especially when you know, you're going to do some semi unattended operation when you're at home and you're doing other things uh, or when you're sleeping. Um, again, let it operate low power. And here's an example of some whisper performance um, snapshot of something I did on the 10th of January with a five meter octagonal loop on 40 meters working everywhere from Africa, South America, America, New Zealand, Australia, China. And then 
On the 15th of January, using a 10 meter octagonal loop made from 28 millimeter copper, copper uh, getting uh, the Antarctic. So how do you get started on Whisper? Quite easily, you can use WSJTX or whichever your favorite software tool is for digital modes, or you can uh, get a QRP Labs kit. Soto Beams have a Whisper Lite Flexi device that you can plug in. You can build your own Arduino Whisper Beacon. There's a link to one. Your tablets, there's some software you can plug into uh, Beacon for Android. There's iWhisper. There's a number of different options. Uh, relatively easy. If you if you Google YouTube, you know, you'll get onto Whisper quite easily. Highly recommended for testing. This is obviously one way. This is you sending out a signal, your location, your power level, and getting a report back for what was the strength of your signal received. So we built the loop. Obviously, we need to tune the loop. So how does one tune a loop? Tuning a loop really comes down to, you know, using your ear, tuning for noise, using a pan adapter, and you can literally watch uh, signal strength increase, or using an antenna analyzer. I use a, a UKIT's antenna an analyzer, and I can actually just see the sweep exactly where resonance is coming in. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that magnetic loops with their high Q, you do need to retune them every 10 or 20 kilohertz that you're moving. So it's really not user friendly in winter or if it's sitting in the attic. So you do want to remotely tune it one for safe operating, two for convenience, and three, uh, to have some sort of auto magic antenna system. So we'll get into some options for that shortly. Now, in order to control the loop, I strongly recommend the uh, the NEMA 17 uh, stepper motors. The one on the left hand side, you know, it's relatively small, 65 newton, uh, 0.65 newton meters of t holding torque. Very, very, very effective at turning the most stubborn of uh, vacuum variable capacitors. And if you're looking for um, finer movements, especially when you've got a capacitor that is, you know, 300 to 350 puff, or you're building um, something that is one tenth or one twelfth of the wavelength, and you, you're not building a QRO loop, and you need some precision movements, then I suggest you use something with a planetary gearbox. You know, if I want high speed tuning, uh, I use the without a planetary gearbox, and those when I want absolute precision tuning, with micro stepping, then uh, I use a planetary gearbox. Both are um, perfectly uh, suitable. Now, how do you control the stepper motor? There's two ways. The inexpensive way, which will cost you under a tenner, get yourself an Arduino, get you an, yourself an A4988 uh, stepper motor driver, and a rotary encoder. Again, from your favorite sources or the online websites, auction websites. Simple little diagram that's available there in the links and a sketch that you can download. Really easy. Rotate the encoder and the stepper motor will turn with it. No more than that. And you're going to need to use a, uh, you can then record step the positions that you were holding at in the rotary encoder. You can then get more sophisticated and you can get a counter to see how many turns you've done. There's a number of options out there. There's some people have built some, uh, I think of manual tune solutions. This is very effective for getting going because it's inexpensive to get going. However, if you want to really exploit magnetic loop antennas, truly leverage the benefit of them, I would look to something like a automatic loop tuner by Lofter Jonasson. This allows you to tune a loop in real time by tracking the CIV or CAT output of your radio against tuned solutions that are stored in the controller. If you think that you've got a fixed amount of inductance and the capacitance that can variable, that can vary, you now st store a tuning solution for seven megs, 7.1, 7.2, 10 megs, 14 megs. It will then interpolate and exp extrapolate tuning solutions in between, or you can st store point solutions these controllers tune in a linear fashion and interpolates the capacitor position between preset positions. 
very 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 smart solution supports all radio types it even has a virtual vfo for those of you using the old ft 101s ease from the 70s now the other thing you can do which is really nice with the uh, automated tuning is to have a tandem match which then allows you to uh get an SWR tune solution. And what it does is it does an SWR sweep itself and the tuner will then tune for the dips in a match for you. Now this is interesting when, for example, in winter your temperature can swing from let's say 10 degrees to zero or below and the copper contracts or expands. So the inductance will vary, therefore the capacitance offset will vary as well. And this just allows you to calibrate your loop very, very, very effectively, as well as giving you a, a power meter in your loop controller. For those of you who find you know loops are interesting and you want to use it for receive purposes, that's one thing, but if you want to then build your own power meter, Lofter has also got a very nice power meter uh, solution on uh, the website link below. Now, As I mentioned to you, I have a, a tuning solution for 10 through 160 meters. I have three loops in the garden, which allows me to use the loop controller to switch between the three loops, depending on the band that I'm on. The software in the loop tuner, knowing which frequency I'm on, will know which band I'm on and about which band I'm on, which loop is assigned to that band. So the loop controller has two modes of operating. It has three discrete ranges or two discrete ranges or one discrete range, depending on how many loops you've configured it for, or the, an overlapping range option. So if you've got two loops and one is for 10 through 30 and the other one's for 20 through 40, you can use the overlapping option range and you just flip a switch and it just knows which loop you're using. I tend to prefer the, the non-overlapping uh, discrete ranges because that then allows me to get coverage from 10 through 160. Technically I do 12 through 160 because 10 I have a, a vertical form. Now this is done by switching in relays and if I move to the next slide, forgive the metalwork because this started off as an, an old project that was then repurposed and then repurposed and then repurposed. This is the back end of my loop controller you know, a normal loop controller looks something like that. Let me see if I can get that up there. And then the back of the loop controller. Nothing, uh, not quite as busy as the uh, the loop controller that's on the, the PowerPoint. But the, the, the loop controller that's on the PowerPoint, what it does is I have four stations connect, four radios, four transceivers connected to the loop controller. Two that use CIV, two that use um, CAT. Because this goes into a expert linear, which has two separate inputs, I designate one for CAT, one for CIV. I want to make sure that I'm intercepting the linear keying so that if I'm key down and I don't have a good match, the linear is not initialized, activated. So hence you'll see one, two, three, four up here. These are the linear key intercepts. I then use eight pin DIN connectors for um, where you see one, two, three over here. That is to control the stepper motors for three different loops. And then an eight pin DIN for controlling relays for uh, band switching between the, the different loops. All right. The other thing I just want to touch on, see how we do for time. In order to eliminate noise, because as I mentioned to you before, if you can't hear the remote station, you can't work the remote station. So loops allow you to eliminate a lot of the noise in the near field, but it doesn't eliminate the noise from your fellow ham operators who are putting out hash because of the 
or noise in Europe, or whatever the noise might be. So using a X phase a noise eliminator plugged into a loop and a wire antenna allows you to subtract the noise or whatever signals it's receiving from what you have on your loop. This has allowed me often to work stations that other folks in the UK are not hearing. So I do highly recommend, in addition to building a loop, or if not building a loop, look at a noise, an X-phase noise eliminator. There's a circuit diagram there, and there is an industrious individual who's got it on eBay. This has made a huge difference to my operating experience, especially with all the noise in my environment. This has allowed me to eliminate a significant portion of the noise. Great. So that brings us to some references that I've got available for you and uh, will allow us to get into uh, some Q&A. Well, thank you very much. And we do have uh, several questions uh, for you, actually. Uh, John, MI0WGX. Oh, yeah, had to be this one. Uh, how, how do homebrewed loops compare to things like the Chiro Matsoni baby loop yeah, in the experience of that type of equipment? How do they compare? Well, look, it's, that's a magnificently engineered piece of equipment. I'd say the first thing that how it compares, it compares favorably in terms of your pocket and your budget. Any loop that you're going to buy is... Um, It's going to be more expensive than going off to your local hardware store and buying pipe and uh, putting it together. In terms of performance, no performance difference. You said I heard you say that you'd built a few loops for uh, for people. Uh, have you any thoughts of going commercial? You know, I believe in open source thinking. Um, you know, if anybody you know would like me to make a loop for them, I'll gladly do it. You know, I'm not. It's just down to the amount of time. I think the problem is when you ask someone who's doing it as, as a favor, then the timeline is going to be potentially protracted. But commercially, um, I'm really impressed. You know, if, if the, the Manzoni loops are literally the Ferrari of loops. Uh, they, they are extremely well engineered. Um, maybe, maybe. We'll, 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 we'll think about it. We'll think about it. If anybody's got the manufacturing facilities, happy to have a chat. Yeah, keep watching this uh, space. Uh, M1DDD, I think that's Nick, asks for comments from Uri Magloop Safety. And this is vis a vis Ofcom's intention to add <clears throat> e license conditions requiring compliance with this, what is it, ICN, IRP, general public limits on exposure to RF. So. <clears throat> Well, I can tell you one thing. When I key down on my loops, I don't see the birds change direction when they're flying. So um, I need more. I need to do some more research into this. But one thing is for sure, I like to make sure that um, I have a neon or fluorescent light nearby. So anybody in my household who knows if I'm transmitting, there is RF in the air. I also make sure that uh, whatever the um, the guidelines are from the FCC and Ofcom and the European regulators, I increase the limits. I think, I think we don't know enough about the effects of uh, electromagnetic radiation on the human body. Um, I think that um, don't underestimate it. Um, I think stay tuned. My, one of my next talks will certainly be on that. Okay. And I think from what you were saying, you probably, um, well, the, the main risk at the moment is the smell of roast pork if you uh, if you touch the thing. Well, it's, uh, yeah, so it's just, just on that, that's actually a very good point. If you've got a pacemaker or some sort of medical implant and touching the loop, you're going to get a, you're going to get a jolt. You know, I, I have, I've had a whoopsie or two with my antenna analyzer thinking, ah, it's a, you know, a couple of, a couple of milliwatts going in there and you touch it and then you don't actually feel anything, but you know, the next day, you're feeling you know, something is not quite right in my arm. So uh, that could just be the arthritis. I don't know, but definitely you, 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 you feel something. So do not touch a loop that's when you're keying down. It's, 
It's not healthy. It's not good for you. Um, yeah. The other thing, just just really, you do want to make sure you're choking anything going back into your sh your shack, because you will be injecting in the near field because it's so close to the loop current into those control cables. Uh, I have had RF bites from insufficient choking on the control lines, especially when they aren't running at 90 degrees from the, the loops. Yeah, I can remember that smell quite well from years and years ago. Uh, Brian at G1FNS says, if mounted horizontally more than a quarter wave above ground, is the angle of transmission broadly the same if it's vertical? Vertically orientated has an extremely low takeoff angle when it's circular. Uh, you do get changes in its takeoff angle depending on the shape. Horizontally, um, I've not operated horizontally in any, um, what's the word, to any great degree. I would imagine you will have a similar properties, uh, but I can't speak authoritatively to that. Okay. Mike G4CDF says, uh, any suggestions for building a receive loop only to see if a full transmitting loop is, is worth the effort? I mean, you touched on noise and he's thinking obviously of the receive noise environment, which is a big issue for, for many of us. So by all means, I think what you do, go, off, go get a variable capacitor. It doesn't matter what its voltage current rating is. Um, I can, afterwards send a link to some receive loop designs, but you may want to look to an active receive loop. Um, the, if you want to test it out, get a piece of coax, just a regular piece of RG213. Uh, it's an, any, any butterfly capacitor, try it with five watts. You know, you, you'll be you'll be well impressed with what you you'll be lighting up Europe quite easily. But as for a receiver, yeah, oh sorry, guess come. No, no, you're going to you were moving on to say about receiving antennas because he was asking about receiving ah, antennas. about receiving, receiving antennas uh, again. Uh, you know, you the beauty of it, of these receiving antennas is because of the sharp nulls, anything that's particularly noisy in your near field, you can tune out by just twisting it. So again, get a you know a inexpensive vacuum uh, inexpensive variable capacitor get some wire multi-turn there's some very good links i can share on that um there's no specific recommendations that i can make other than it's a tuned circuit okay okay and um still more questions coming in actually uh, gareth g4xat any thoughts on figure of eight loops or multi-turn loops so I definitely prefer a single turn loop over multi turn loops, and without question. Obviously, space prohibits that on some occasions. As you see, now I've got a three turn loop for 160 meters. I do not recommend anything above four turns. After two is about the maximum you want to go to, three is a push, four limit. The figure of eight. If you can do a figure of eight, you've got the height. So why not just make a regular loop? There's no additional benefit to a figure of eight over a regular circular loop from my operating experiences. I've I've done some A-B comparisons and I've not, again, it's down to my QTH. I need to do a few more locations, but I've not seen any benefits over a single turn loop. Over a, over a two turn loop, a figure of eight is better than a two-turn loop. Okay. I've got to stop watching you on YouTube because you're still running on YouTube. Um, another question, probably the last one uh, for today, is uh, basically John Snag, G4HUN, indoors or outdoors? If you're operating QRO outdoors, without question. Otherwise, you're going to be injecting RF into your household wiring and various other things and messing with your signal. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, you know, you can operate uh, QRP indoors. Uh, you know, I've, when I've traveled, stayed in hotels and the likes, I've done that without issue. I just actually, I put it by the window. Um, but if you're going to op operate at any kind of power levels, no. 
Okay, I think we've got the message there, Al. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for enlightening us on uh, on Mag Loops. Hopefully, uh, some of us watching today will have been inspired to uh, to give them a go. Thank you very much for your time and your expertise. And uh, you said um, there's a contact um, that people can get you at if they want more information. Yes. So, if anybody is interested, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me, m0rtp at pasta.com. Have a look at my QRZ page. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to share, help, advise. You know, regularly speaking at clubs, regularly speaking one on one to folks. You know, I'm, I'm extremely passionate and enthusiastic on this topic. You know, magnetic loop antennas are not garden warmers. With 209 odd countries worked uh, in less than a year, uh, 800 plus counties in the US, I can assure you extremely effective. I'm going to leave you the following thought. If you can't hear him, you can't work him. A loop is not as nearly as efficient as a, uh, a beam antenna, but you don't need the space or the height for a beam. And what you can do with a loop is you can just add more power. Hence the QRO loop. QRO loop. If they can't hear you, dial it up. Can't hear you, dial it up. But don't start with your dials at 11. All right. Thank you very much.